So hello, um, I'm talking to you from my home in Colombia, which is a long way away, um, sitting in my living room, having seen this now for the third time. And I guess the, the first thing I have to say, and it's not a question, is just what an enormous thrill it is in, in the middle of this long and terrible time that we have been, all of us, dealing with, um, to see how an artist creates the new, yes? Um, this is the new. This is a form of dance that we haven't seen. Um, these are shapes and lights and, and sounds that we haven't seen all put together in this way. It's mysterious, it's startling, um, it's deeply moving. And so I, I just want to say I'm very, very appreciative of the opportunity to see this. Um, and I guess there are so many things to talk about in, in the context of this work, but I would start, I think, by, by addressing both this piece and the one that you stunned us with last year, a much shorter piece, Cooped, mm -hmm. because I think that they may both be fragments of what ends up being an opus, really. Um, and, and so my first question would be, you've spent your artistic life mostly in a black dance company, in the Ailey Company, uh, and you have been living within the world of black art for all of these many years. But and so it's not like you haven't spoken or danced or choreographed as a black person, but in these terrible times that we've been through, the Black Lives Matter movement and the death of George Floyd, and I say the death of George Floyd because I'm referring to the mourning involved and not just to the assassination of George Floyd. Um, I think they made all of us have monumental shifts in our thinking, and not only about race, um, about humanity. And so I'm wondering if that same shift took place in your mind in the course of these last 16 or so months, and how they might have affected the shape of this work. Right, um, thank you, first of all, for your uh, kind words. Um, it's a, kind of a loaded question. I, to be honest, I, um, I'm a very sort of uh, instinctual and uh, sort of maker of things. It's very, I mean, once I, I have an idea, yes, I take that idea and I really, you know, pry into it and, and try to pull apart as many things as I can from it to then create a, a whole work. But in the work that you've seen here and in, and in Cooped, a lot of this work that I do alone by myself, that's not with other dancers, it's, it's more stream of consciousness to me. So if, if, if there was a shift, the shift you know, it, it, it's in there, but it is, it's not something that I, that I, that's very tangible to me or that is um, purposeful, I should say, when I go into the process of making these works. Um, I, uh, the thing that I, I, I love about making work in solitude is that um, there's so, there's so much that I think and that I feel that I don't actually get to say or express to other people. And so once I'm in this work, once it's finished, actually, I'm able to see what it is that I was feeling or what it is that I was thinking, mm -hmm. or what it is that I was actually getting at. But that's never there in the inception. It's just me um, choosing a point of view and just moving and just making and uh, following the current until it is finished. No, that clearly shows, yeah. Um, and I couldn't help thinking that, you know, wherever it was in, in the back of your mind as a spectator, I couldn't help thinking about George Floyd and I couldn't help thinking about the fact that he was 
a big man, yeah, mm -hmm. um, with very dark skin, and and somehow there was an embodiment of all sorts of emotions around that. Um, so again, to to turn back to the historical moment, I I'm in Colombia where. I think the Black Lives Matter movement had an enormous strength and power, not just in the United States, but in Mexico, in Colombia, in Brazil, anywhere there's a large Black population. Um, there, there was a real sense, I think, in Black communities of, Jesus, enough of this shit, you know? Um, and, and the sense that it was possible to do something. Um, and so for those of us in Latin America, and I, I, I know in the United States, that whole event threw us back into a kind of ocean of reflection about, oh, I don't know, death, justice, who we are, why we are. Um, and so again, I know how instinctually you work, but were there questions that you were dealing with even as you were moving? questions that you were trying to solve by moving? Yeah, um, there were. Um, this piece was sort of made in two parts. Um, I think I started this back in January. I took a huge break, that's what I consider a huge break, to go and work on another project. And then I, I revisited again, um, basically like, like a month ago. Um, yeah, there, there, there are certain conversations that are, that are going on in my head. I think a lot of this work is actually more autobiographical, <laughs> I would say. Um, uh, when I read Zora Neale Hurston's How It Feels to Be Colored Me, she, she speaks of an experience um, where she first realized that she was colored. You know, going from her all black community in Eatonville, Florida, and then moving to Jacksonville, Florida, shortly after that, which is a predominantly white city. And when I was making this work, I think I originally wanted to make something that was very sort of close to me in my lived experience. And for some reason, her experience was the first one that I thought of because I think that there, um, there well, I know that there's a similarity there. I moved uh, in 1992 after Hurricane Andrew sort of destroyed Miami. I moved from my all black community in Miami to Jacksonville, Florida, the same as Zora. And I was sort of thrusted into uh, an all white school, we moved into upper middle class <laughs> white suburbia. And that was a really shocking sort of experience for me. One that I was never really able to um, unpack until now. And I think maybe in this work is sort of where I sort of doing that. Um, and you mentioned George Floyd and his size and his colors being like a big uh, dark skinned man. I honestly, didn't really feel that I was a big dark skinned man during those times because of my sort of like wanting to to assimilate or to fit into this sort of whiteness that I was surrounded by. So I think that's definitely a conversation that was being had in my mind during the, the making of this piece. And then there's also the latter, the latter half of it where there are these sort of um, I guess you could say the end of it where I'm sort of in this cocooned kind of shape right there at the very end of the, mm -hmm. of the film. I was just trying to, that's one moment um, that comes to mind where some, it was a very specific ideal where I was trying to demonstrate or, or show these, these two different dynamics of um, sort of being comfortable being black and being comfortable in the environment of of extreme whiteness so there is a like a comfort there and like a uh, you know the the subject in the film looks a little bit snuggly but at the same time that small space that feels very very uh constricting that feels very uh suppressing um and so those are two examples of conversations that were being had mm -hmm. and i think overall um, abstraction was definitely something that was very present in my mind from the selection of the music to um, a lot of the movement that you saw in the beginning of the film. I was basically trying to, because um, essentially what I'm dealing with is a, is a feeling and I think feelings in themselves are a little bit abstract and they're very fleeting and 
you know, one thing, one day you're feeling this thing, the next day you're feeling the other. And so I was just trying to sort of capture what it was that I was feeling without being uh, literal. No, not at all. I'm sorry, I'm so hoarse. I'm, I'm <clears throat> good. <No> problem. <laughs> Try to speak more clearly. Um, I, I want to talk a lot about the actual making of the work, mm -hmm. but I was just thinking when I came to New York from Mexico and it wasn't even a skin color thing because I'm not particularly dark skinned, mm -hmm. but it was just a complete way of being thing. Um, and eventually I found that New York was like the capital of the world. And this was a place where you could fit in and find yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and also that art made a difference in, in the freedom you had to move and be yourself. Um, and my question now, although it wasn't for a very long time, is that true for black artists as well? Um, I think so. Are you just... Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it is through it is through the work that I make and through the dances that I've danced. I started dancing professionally at 18 years old. So there's a lot of life that I had to learn from you know that point up until now. And it is yeah. totally 100 percent due to uh, being steeped in an artistic environment. And like you said, being uh, in the Ailey Company in a Black artistic environment, it sort of forced me to really um, see myself um, as myself and also in relationship to the work that I was doing. When you, when you think about the work that Alvin Ailey made, um, me having to go on stage and embody those characters and embody that work, that in turn forces me to question myself and say, okay, where, how do I fit into this? Where, what parts of me can I bring to this work? And so there was a lot of um, learning to do. And then after that, there was a lot of freedom <laughs> that it gave me. I, I was actually going to ask about the Yaley Company and that specifically, because um, I think one of the notable major things he did was to create a movement vocabulary for not only black sorrow and black joy, but for the black spiritual experience, really, based on the black social world. And as a choreographer and now the resident choreographer in the Ailey Company, um, is it one of your purposes to create a, a kind of equivalent? Alvin created Revelation 60 years ago or so. Um, and so are you trying to create a, a new way of movement or a new embodiment? I am not, I'm not. I think if anything, um, I'm thinking more of stories. I'm thinking uh -huh. of the, the stories that he told and the sort of life that he lived. And I'm trying to bring those stories into now. They are the same they uh they they read differently they look differently and i think that um that's sort of like the beauty of what i what, what i get to do i like to, i get to be um a bit of an, an archaeologist or something where i go back and i see like the old bones of something or the old uh pattern or the shape or the the construction of something and i can sort of figure out how can i take the most, the essence of that thing, and then bring it here to where we are now and sort of give it a story that is very uh, relevant to where we are. So I'd like to talk about the actual film. First of all, the music. Can you tell us about the music? Um, <laughs> I can tell you some things about the music. Um, it was created by a a music duo called Black Spirituals. Black Spirituals is uh, Marshall Trammell on the drums and Zachary James Watkins on guitar and, and electronic stuff. I do not know them personally. Um, I'm a very sort of adventurous person when it comes to music. I love uh, all different types of sounds. I do not know how I came across their music, but um, I definitely sort of fell in love with it, especially in relationship to 
uh, this work because I was desperately um, sonically looking for something that was different from the music that I used before from like Don Pullen and John Coltrane and these guys. I wanted something that also felt very um, acoustic and, you know, like for a drum, a, a drum set, for example, something that feels very human, but also something that also feels very non-human um, and sort of have those two worlds kind of uh, collide. But I, I thank Black Spirituals for the music, for, for bringing that music into the world. <laughs> When I saw the film the first time, they've been repairing something outside my house and they have like this little home sized cement mixer and it goes all the time kind of rattle, 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 round, 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 rattle, yeah. rattle, rattle. And it fits so perfectly that I thought it was part of the music. Mm -hmm. And when the work ended, the cement mixer was still going rattle, 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 round, round, round. And I didn't realize that the piece had ended because of that. It has that very abstract but very concrete sound at the same time. I thought it was terrific. Um, what about the camera? If I understand correctly, when you did Cooped, it was you and an iPad and a floor lamp, is that right? Yeah, a couple of other um, dealy bobbies. Yeah, a couple of other things. <laughs> but um, very, very little, very little resources, yeah. And what about now? Did you have a camera person? Did you have different equipment? Well, originally this piece was supposed to be, I was not supposed to be the subject of this work. I initially wanted another dancer to um, be in it, but due to some scheduling conflicts that didn't happen. Um, so yes, I had to um, do the camera thing all by myself, <laughs> which um, I, I love, but at the same time, um, I was sort of a little bit stressed out about it because I was like, well, I want to get more angles. How can I do that with just my own body? Or how can I rig or make some type of machine that can like run around me like as I dance? That obviously didn't happen, but it kind of worked out because a, a large part of this work when it comes to like the visual aesthetic, I think is inspired by um, the Glenn Ligon painting. Uh, it's essentially a painting um, by the, the same title. Um, how it feels to be yeah. like me. And in this in this painting, yeah. it's, you know, it's it's very two-dimensional surface. And so I wanted to sort of keep that two-dimensionality, that sort of like flatness and not really get into the sort of like 3D world of it all. I think it it sort of like was a benefit for me because it was just myself, but it, it, I think it also stayed true to the actual vision of um, uh, one of the elements that inspired the work, so. Well, it's strange because I was thinking that one of the ways that you can see this work is as a painting or as just a purely visual thing or, or action painting or painting in movement, something like that. And so it turns out that there was that aspect of it, that, that highly graphic aspect of it. Yeah, um, I had this idea of, you know how, um, I don't know if you ever had like a, I think it's called a magic eight ball. And it's like an eight ball. It has like a little cube in it. You're supposed to ask it a question and you shake it up and then an answer kind of appears out of it. But I was thinking like if, if you could take the text itself, uh -huh. um, how it feels to be colored me. And if that text could magically morph and start to like show you images of how it actually feels. And then that to me kind of like was the idea of how I wanted this work to sort of look, like if words, if text could turn into yeah. images. Yeah. I didn't remember that there was a Zora Neale Houston book called that. And I'm struck now by the fact that that title has inspired two other works of art, um, where my first reaction, your first title was just colored me, right? And then you decided to use the whole sentence. Um, and, and so I, I thought that's so weird. Colored is like such a 1950s word, you yeah. know, like when everybody was trying to sweep the whole thing under the rug. Exactly. Um, yeah. so, but obviously it, it resonates very deeply, but again, about the actual making of this film, um, you had a better camera, you had still your iPad. Oh no, no, I didn't. I didn't have the iPad. I got a better camera. Now. 
Uh, uh -huh. And there's also some iPhone camera footage in there as well. But no, the iPad is, has been put to sleep. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very old, old generation iPad. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how you got those incredible close-ups, you know, that were just so beautiful, like landscapes. Yeah. And I thought, the iPad can do this? My God, I've been wasting my time. Um, and, and you edited then? Yes. You did your own editing. I did my own editing, absolutely. Um. Uh, th this is something else that comes across to me in the work at least, is this great sense of isolation or, or of loneliness. Yeah. Um, and it's a contrast to the Ailey work where it's all about community and vitality, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you sense that as a relief, you sense that how? Well, I, I think that speaks more to who I am as a person. I think that as, as a creative, if I, if I had the choice, I would much prefer to you know, create alone and in solitude. I feel like that's where I can sort of um, hone my ideas better or like contain everything and control everything a bit more. Um, or bigger works, uh, things involving more people, it's sort of like you have to share your vision with so many other people. And the more that it gets away from you, the more that you feel like you feel very uncertain if you're going to get a very good in product, <laughs> a very good in product, because, you know, no one's going to care about the work as much as you care about it because they aren't you. Um, so I think that sort of loneliness that you feel in this work is definitely, um, that's just me. Not to say that I'm a lonely person, but I think that there is yeah. definitely um, a comfort in sort of being alone with your thoughts. And if you're thinking about things as deeply as the, the context of this film and, and Cooped and the other ones, it's sort of, it's sort of, the piece becomes a bit of a, a, a journal or, or, or a diary or something like that of like mm -hmm. sort of your yeah. deepest uh, inner sort of thoughts or dialogue. Well, I'm a writer now, so I, I certainly understand that. But speaking as a former dancer, as a dancer I once was, I would kill, I would kill to dance in one of your works. <laughs> and I would care, I swear to God, I would care about it every bit as much as you do. It would be, you know, like a life project. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you know as a dancer how deeply you invest yourself in it. Yeah. Well, it depends. I mean, right? If, it, if you're a dancer and you know that you are participating in the creation of a new, mm -hmm. that's my God, an opportunity. I, I, As opposed I, I've definitely worked with a couple of dancers that, that would share your sentiment <laughs> uh, <laughs> right now. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more. And, I, and I, I adore them for that. You know, it really helps to, to have that kind of support, especially when you're trying to work as deep as you can. Um, it can be very scary and it can be, uh, yeah, scary essentially. So to have that kind of support of, of a dancer or someone that's willing to like go along with the ride with you is, um, is awesome. To take all the risks. Yeah. yeah, it's very different from dancing in something that has already been done and been established No. Yeah. Can you see right now how you're going to continue working? And is there, are you already thinking about the next I am, I am not, um, or maybe I am. I think it always starts with uh, me listening to some music mm -hmm. I've never listened before. I think I have tons of music that is just kind of sitting around. It's probably going to take until the end of my life in order for me to sort of hear it all. But um, I was thinking today as I was listening to some of it that this is how it starts. So to answer your question, yes, maybe I am on to the next thing because I've already started this sort of uh, listening that goes on. And it's not, in the beginning, it's not very um, uh, intense listening. It's not very active, but it's just me sort of putting on sounds. And I think I'm just trying to figure out, just trying to find a soundtrack to what's going on 
in here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you talk about jazz a little bit? Because when we talked the last time, you did talk about how much that music in particular meant to you. So yeah. why jazz and why not Vivaldi or well, oh, <laughs> or, 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 or you know. Um, I often, actually don't like to talk about uh, my relationship to jazz too much, only because there's a lot of uh, people that are like jazz botanicas out there. And my, my, I think that my relationship to music in general, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's very instinctual. Anything mm -hmm. and everything that I know about music, it is from uh, music that I've seen live, um, YouTube clips, books I've read on music, and the rest is just pure instinct and what I consider personal taste. Um, I would say Coltrane over Vivaldi because for me, that feels more authentic to um, uh, who I am as a person. It feels more, uh, more authentic to um, me culturally, um, spiritually. Um, I love the sort of like free jazz the sort of avant-garde stuff that took place like in the late 60s. Um, it has this like essence of uh, spirituality in it and it reminds me of um, the gospel church that I used to go to with my grandma when I was younger. Um, I, 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 I don't really know <laughs> so much what the, the draw is. I can't really articulate it for you 100%, but um, it's definitely there and I feel like it's a, it's a, a never ending sort of um, exploration for me. I think that music, kind of like dance, it's, it's the language is as big as you, uh, big as you make it, you know? Mm -hmm. The more inventive you can be, the more that you're sort of stretching out more ideas that can be expressed and more things that can be said. And I think when it comes to uh, jazz music, from my understanding, the idea is always to to sort of free it up, do you know what I mean? To uh, ex expand, so. Yeah. Just because one ends up in places one didn't mean to go to when you're on YouTube, right? I ended up at the funeral of Alain Toussaint. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce his last name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, new, the New Orleans great mm -hmm. figure. So there's his funeral and there's everybody emerging, I guess, from the church. And, and the music was so weird and abstract and powerful and painful, you know, all at the same time. And then where it ends up, just that transition, I thought, my God, what you're saying, it can be as big as you need it to be. It can express all of these things in yeah. the most remarkably disparate ways. Um, I can't wait to see what you do next. I, I wish it were done already so that I could be looking at it now. Um, and I think it's time for us to turn over uh, this conversation to the audience. I'm sure there are a ton of questions and answers. And uh, Lauren is very kindly going to act as moderator for this, and I'm going to disappear. And then we're going to come back at the very end and anyone who wants to can watch the film again. So right. what a pleasure, what a great privilege. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Alma. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Keel. I'm the executive director of CBA. I am a white woman with uh, shoulder length brown hair and I'm sitting in front of a white wall. Um, Jamar, the first question has to do with your sense of time and duration. So this says, I'm interested in Jamar's sense of time and duration, by which I mean, how do you feel time in your choreography? In particular, in solos, how do you know how long something should last? How do you know when enough is enough? What impact the duration will have on the viewer? Is this something that matters and causes a lot of thought in your process or is this more of an instinctual thing? Um, it definitely matters. Um, not a lot of thought is there, but there is, there is thought. Um, I, I think it's, um, I, well, my relationship to time, I guess when I'm making dances, I'm always trying to get it as close to real time, real life time. So if, um, 
you know, one dancer comes and kisses the other dancer on the cheek, the reaction can't be immediate, or maybe it could be immediate depending on the situation. But I'm always sort of gauging how I'm using time, not in relationship to um, uh, this is a performance, you know, the audience wants to see me react, but like in real actual time, if this really happened to you in real life, what would be your real time reaction to that? Um, and that sort of kind of helps me gauge how long something should extend. And, and, and that, and also my, my own personal taste, I think that I am very critical of the work that I do. So sometimes I don't wanna sit and look at one image for, <laughs> for too long. Like I instinctually don't wanna see it. And so I try to push it a little bit more to like move on. Or maybe I feel like this is a really nice moment. And it's something that I think others will think is nice as well. And so I spend a little bit more time, but I think it's, I think it's just all instinctual and just personal um, feeling and, and taste. Great. Um, thank you. This next question you actually touched on a bit, but I don't know if you want to say more. The question was, is Glenn Ligon's visual work important to you uh, in, in your practice? So I know you've referenced that, but if there's anything else more broadly, maybe. Yeah. maybe. His work is not important to me in my practice, but I remember um, in the early days when I first moved to New York and I would go to the MoMA. I think he had a work in the MoMA. Maybe it's still there. It's like a neon light sign of the word America. I'm not really sure, but for right now, that's the, the work that sort of stands out to me. But I think it was his work was like one of the first sort of like works of a black male art maker that I was exposed to where I could like say his name and like uh, match the name to the work when I first when I first moved to New York. So not, you know, his work isn't something that I, you know, I'm, I'm following closely in my practice, but it's definitely sort of um, outstanding in my mind. Great. I'm reading these in real time, so forgive me here. Um, <laughs> This person uh, says they're struck by the layering of different moments in time with the silhouettes um, accumulating in the film. And was this visual effect uh, tied to an intent uh, to make the body feel strange or abstract? Um, were the close crops influenced by surrealist film at all? Um, the close crops were not influenced by surrealist films, but the, the layering of the layering of the bodies, the sort of dual sort of uh, uh, bodies that you see in some shots and also this, I don't know what you call it, like a, a after effect that you kind of see. I think, um, well, if, if there's ever a double body within the film, I'm referring to what uh, W.B. Du Bois uh, referred to as a double consciousness. And so there's like the awareness of you as yourself and then there's like the awareness of how you appear from an outsider that outsider in the context of this being like the white gaze. And so there is a definite sort of intentional um, duality that I'm trying to express here. In a lot of the painterly sort of, what do you call that? Uh, trails that, <laughs> that kind of appear within the film. That's just me going, uh, referencing back to the Glenn Ligon uh, painting. And like at the top of the painting, it's very clear and very legible. It says how it, feel, how it feels to be colored me. And as you sort of scroll down the painting, the words become less and less legible. So I was just basically trying to kind of embody that within this, um, within this film. Great, thank you. Um, so this one says, I'm interested in learning uh, more about your relationship to music. Um, and how do you feel your choreography interacts with the music? And does the music guide or lead the emotions, narrative, and structure of the mu movements that you explore? Um, do you feel that you search for the music that fits the movement or the narrative ideas, just in general or in this work in particular? That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, I wanna say it's, it's sort of feelings and narrative and context first, and then I try to find music that sort of matches matches that. So there's a, an extensive amount of like listening and listening until I find something that sort of um, 
marries what it is that I'm trying to say. Um, and that that could that could be any it could be any 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 music. I think it's it's really the story that I have inside. If it's something that feels very personal, then maybe I'll look for music that's a bit more sparse or that's a bit more um, that can kind of fill up the space. You know, if it's just a solo or if it's just my body or if it's something that I'm feeling that involves uh, lots of people. It, it, it really just depends on the, on the story that I'm trying to tell. That sort of depends on what genre I go and what sort of energy I'm looking for. But it's a really, it's a hard thing to kind of describe, to describe, sorry, person. It's fine. I think any, uh, any way you, you look at it is uh, insightful for us. Um, a couple more here and I'm just keeping my eye on the time. Um, this question is, does the camera's gaze have a color? A persona? Is it a mirror? Ooh. Wow. Is it a mirror? Is it me? <laughs> um, that's that's a really good question. I'm going to write that one down. I'm going to think about it. Um, I do not have an answer for that, but it's very very good. <laughs> Thank you, audience. Um, all right, let's try this. Um, as a dancer, what about NYC has changed for you spatially, if anything, post-pandemic? Spatially, post-pandemic. Um, I think I've been allowed more space. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as a dancer, I think pre-pandemic, I was on a very I was on a, a dancer schedule. That means uh, class, rehearsal until seven, and then you know you, you go to bed, you come home, you go back to work and you do it again. And so for me, that feels uh, very tight, just being on that schedule. You know the exact spaces that you're gonna be in every time, but post pandemic, I could be at Center for Ballet <laughs> or I could be in the Ailey Studios or I could be, so like the amount of uh, studios that I, spaces that I'm in are different and those spaces have less people in them because of COVID and so for me I feel like I feel that it's been more more spacious. It's interesting that, that you feel the more space and yet the, the work that we just talked about so. Uh. <laughs> um, Okay, so I think with that, I want to invite um, Alma back for any uh, concluding questions or, or comments there. And then um, at the end of this event, we do want to leave time um, for anyone who wants to stick around to just view the film one more time um, in the context of this conversation. So I will duck out now um, and welcome back Alma and thank you, Jamar. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I have one question for you and, and for CBA, Lauren, which is, uh, some people have just written me that they weren't able to get in, uh, possibly be from Colombia. That happens occasionally. Uh, so for people who would like to see this conversation and weren't able to attend, will it be accessible? And, and how, if you could put that up? Yes, it will. Um, my colleague Courtney will leave uh, instructions in the chat uh, to share with um, whomever needs to see. Great. Um, I just wanted to encourage whoever has the time uh, to stay to watch this film again. I know that there was this little piece that Radmanski did, um, a kind of pandemic piece, and um, with uh, Leonard Bernstein music, I can't remember the name of it, it was very parady. But one of the things about video dance is that there are benefits, just like there were benefits for you, Jamar, from you know, the, the spaciousness of time, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't have the tremendous sensual joy of the physical experience with the dancers on stage. You, you miss that energy. On the other hand, you look at it again, and then maybe even again, and it reveals itself to you in, in many different ways. And that's a privilege we don't usually have. So that was all I wanted to say. Um, and again, just how much of a pleasure it is to talk to you. Thank and you, always a pleasure to speak with you, Alma. Thanks so much for um, 
agreeing to just kind of <laughs> come in here. All <laughs> the from the thank you. Hang out and have a good time. And thank you to the audience too for being here. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, I just want to add my thanks to both of you uh, for, for taking the, you know, the great uh, opportunity to look at this work and to talk with us about it. 